taking this time. It's a real pleasure. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start hopefully somewhere that I might be able to endear myself to you and show you that I that I took this interview very seriously. Um, I heard an interview you did where you were talking about Sirens of Titan and your reference of Peter Arnett, who is this great award-winning journalist that you grew up watching. Peter Arnett in a Baghdad hotel. Peter Arnett showing us Baghdad getting bombed in hell. And you said in the thing, you, you were curious if he had heard the song. I am, so yeah. I, I have an update on that for you. Okay. Yeah. So yesterday I tried to get and put on my investigative hat and I emailed his son, Andrew, and he wrote me back this beautiful email. And he basically said, the song was brought to Peter's attention last summer. Peter loved it and sent the link to many of his friends. He, we got a big kick out of it. The video is very well done as well. Excellent work. Tim is a fine comedian slash musician. And you can tell Tim we are big fans of his, and we congratulate oh, him on his Sirens of Titan hit. <laughs> that's amazing. That's so nice. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. So I, I wanted to start on the comedy side of things because my, I'm, a, I'm a recent fan of your work, and I can't believe I've been missing the, the oeuvre for so long. But a good friend of mine, this guy Mike Galley, he sent me your stand-up special about, I guess, about two years ago, and he was just like, "Dude, you're gonna love this." And from there, <laughs> I've just gone down the rabbit hole. Nice. Um, so shout out to Mike for for you basically allowing this to happen today. Um, that character that you play that you're about to go on tour, you're not, you don't have some funny name for the, it's Tim Heidecker, yeah. right? So yeah. who is that version of Tim Heidecker? How would you describe him? And how does this guy see the world? Well, I guess simply he's like the id, my id. Um, I, I, he, you know, he's kind of developed and evolved or devolved over the years. I, it started by kind of being in LA and going to friends comedy shows and seeing a lot of people that weren't funny, that were, you know, kind of flailing up there. And I, I grew up kind of a huge Andy Kaufman fan and Albert Brooks and, and guys that kind of, uh, took a meta approach to stand up or comedy where you uh, Steve Martin is another one where you kind of the audience has to be kind of high, you know aware of sort of the tropes and traditions of comedy to kind of get it and uh, so I started by just kind of going up and basically you know in the crudest way kind of making fun of of failing comedians so the girls here are sort of like oh he's married I tell you, usually I'm wearing this here. When I'm on the road, this comes off. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it kind of worked. It slowly kind of just developed, and I kept doing it. And, and you know, when Trump came around uh, and sort of the, the his kind of attitude, his braggadocious kind of uh, swagger or whatever, the, sort of this sort of, um, you know, I, like it's just willfully ignorant and uh proud of his of the ignorance uh that started sort of seeping into the into the into the character and um yeah i think it, it works best i mean i used to do it as kind of a stunt and uh, you know i'd say most of the audience weren't in on the joke and now that i've been doing it enough and my audience gets it and and kind of you know becomes a character, the audience becomes a character uh, in that they pretend that this guy is great, you know? <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very physical. It's very, you know, uh, slapsticky in a lot of ways with the microphone drops and, and, yeah. and a lot of, there's a lot of anger, but it, you know, essentially he's kind of this traditional, 
white male feeling kind of left behind by the world a lot of you know ancient uh misguided ideas of women and Mm. other cultures and stuff and a little bit like um you know there's a little alan partridge in there if i were to show that to someone who is not familiar with sort of the lineage of comedians you're talking about i would I find myself saying things like, so just, just remember, he's trying not to be funny. That's right. And, but is by me just saying that by trying to explain it before I, does that, is that a red flag for you? Is that annoying? Is that not what comedy is about? I hear you. I think I get a little uh, frustrated because the truth is I am trying to be funny. You know, I'm trying to be funny in a different way and I'm trying to make it like, there's no, there's a term anti-comedy that gets used a lot with our work and I understand it's like a it, words are just words and you know we all have to use them to define certain things but um we, in the in my work with Eric or on with Greg with on cinema or the stand up no we're never like trying to not make you laugh we're always trying to make you laugh and um and so I think it is funny and uh but you have to come with sort of an awareness of certain you know a a certain context to the material or you know to the kind of comedy i'm satirizing i guess so uh, yes uh, in a vacuum you could say this character isn't funny but the the sum total of it isn't is my attempt to make the an audience laugh (laughs) but i can't really worry about where they're coming from i just have to kind of do my thing when you came, when you start it, when you come out and you're having the problem with the mic, I was yeah. sitting with one of my friends and I just showed it to him and he was, he was so confused, like what was happening, what's going on. But immediately, like when my friend sent that to me, he, there was no primer of like, this is a character. I was just, I get yeah. it that it was so over the top that it went on so long and you had to sit yeah. in that moment and just, you could, you could, is this real? Were you at, you know, but I yeah. knew of course that it was a bit. And, and analogous kind of thing. That's like very simple and basic, but like, you know, the three stooges are not good plumbers, you know, like they're so and you see a scene of them, uh, you know, failing at at being plumbers. uh, We understand that that's where the humor is, because uh, we are watching them fail, you know, and so, uh, you know, there's a there's a there's kind of I've noticed kind of recently a sort of a wave of uh, literalism, not liberalism, but literalism in in people. People are just kind of gain mm. like people expect what they're seeing should be at face value. And it's, you know, you, you, you kind of see this more in comments on YouTube and on social media and stuff, but people are very quick to react. Their reaction is generally kind of um, taking whatever they're being shown at face value and and that creates, I think, a perception that people don't get it. But, you know, uh, it's also it's, it's also not for everybody. You know, I, right. I totally accept that. Yeah. And I would say that there's a lot of comedy that that you would just classify as comedy that does not make me smile. And I don't, you know, care for. It. So right. yeah, yeah, yeah. it's sort of like, all right, well, what's the difference between those two things? Yeah. yeah. And I think in, in one way, you might be a little bit referring to the whole the opera part of that that was taken out. And I think you were saying that it kind of went viral where you're making fun of going to the opera and telling them to shut up. Yeah. And people were like, who the hell does this guy think he is? Like what, yeah. what a tasteless dude. And obviously that's a right. joke. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was incredible and interesting, but also frustrating from a sort of a bigger macro perspective, because it shows that the people saying that, like, why didn't he just uh, he leave or his wife should leave him or, you know, like, commenting on the character as a real person, it wouldn't take them very long on Google to get a better context of who I am, you know? This show starts, opera starts, you know? And I'm I'm looking around, this guy's up on stage, some jerk's up there going, la 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 la, this and that, booth, right? looking around an hour goes by (laughs) I couldn't take it I stood up I go shut the fuck up uh yeah it just it it points more to sort of the reactionary literal um 
I need to get my take in front of the public as soon as possible before I understand what I'm looking at. Yeah. Uh, trend that's that I see happening. I'm prone to just fact checking everything. I'm sure you see it being on social. Like how many times that someone walks up to a homeless guy to offer him money and there's the hidden camera and you can tell it's an actor. I mean, yeah. I just fact check. I doubt everything I see. And, you know, I'm glad sure. you know this stuff is legit. So it must be, it must be interesting when you get caught up in those kind of things. Um, yeah. On, on the character, just the catharsis maybe of being able to go on stage and be rude to someone in the front audience when maybe there are times where if you weren't in that character, you could be very annoyed, but you have to stay sort of professional. Is there something kind of fun that if you were to yeah. tell to someone to just F off in the front row that they would love that and it actually feels good doing it? Yeah, I, I generally, you know, I'm a pretty, uh, I try to be a respectful, kind uh, individual in society, but there is a, there's certainly a fun, uh, playful element to just tell, you know, I, I would do a bit sometimes where I bring someone up on stage and, and they give them the microphone to say their name. And I take the microphone back and I say, you should brush your teeth. And I would never say that in public, you know, in my yeah. private life, I would never say that despite how bad their breath is, you know, not in a million years would I comment yeah. on someone's breath to them. But yes, the character gives me this, uh, this, you know, shield to be able to get away with that. And in, again, you know, if I did that, if I walked into a random club, nobody knew who I was and did that, I might get my, you know, uh, my head knocked off, but uh, my audience generally is expecting me to behave poorly uh, to people. So they're, they're up for it. You kind of just alluded to this a little bit when you, you said it can kind of be frustrating when people mis misunderstand you, but is it, do you like the fact that you have this very dedicated fan base, people who have supported your work, you've, you've been able to maintain that creative integrity, but like, for example, my mom and dad will, will never understand you. They'll never get it. They'll never think it's funny, but people like me are like, this is the, the most inspiring, coolest shit I've ever seen. Do you, do you like that? Or is that just something you've resigned your fact, the comedy that I've chosen that I'm in love yeah. with just will never be that mainstream kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I always hold hope out for a, it, it to reach as many people as possible. I think the the more that it does, the easier it becomes to do things. I mean, it's pure, purely from like a financial business side. It's like, you know, if something is hitting it with with a big, you know, the more people you have, the, the sort of easier, it, as long as you're able to hold on to, you know, your creative integrity, I say like more the merrier. I don't, I'm not trying to exclude anybody, but of course I'm a realist and understand that, uh, you know, it's not going to be for everybody, but there's plenty of examples. And I, I, you know, again, Steve Martin is a good example of somebody who, when he started and he blew up, uh, he was just doing what exactly what he wanted to do. And there was an integrity to it. Um, and for whatever reason, it clicked with the zeitgeist, you know? So, you know, that happened to, to some extent with, with my work with Eric, with Tim and Eric, it's like, there's a that has that's kind of like almost seeped into the mainstream as far as like you know not to great success of the original material but that it, its influence is felt all over the place and um and people are quick to remind me of that when they see something but um yeah i don't have again these are just kind of things i don't have control over so i just do what i do and and see what sticks yeah, it's interesting about coming out at a certain time in history when something might be hitting the mainstream. I kind of feel that way, like a, a lot of rock musicians right now in sort of the age of hip hop and rap. It's mm -hmm. not really, you know, rock isn't really king anymore. Right. Um, but but curious too, for example, like Radiohead, for example, if they wanted to do OK Computer again and again and again, they could always write that perfect pop album, but yet they can yeah. try to push themselves and be more creative. Do you think if you wanted to try to be Seinfeld-esque and like observational humor that you're like, this is a tight joke written and packaged, do you think you could do it, but you just don't care to, or it's not really in your wheelhouse? I don't know. I think, it, yeah, it's a very specific kind of sensibility that I kind of do a little, I mean, I think I do a little bit on Office Hours, which is the podcast uh, morning uh, live stream show that I do with my friends, Doug and Vic. And I am a little more, I am myself and I make an attempt to be funny in a more tr traditional, whatever, conventional way because I'm talking about my own life and it's not kind of steeped in a meta character. Um, mm. 
So, but you know, I kind of just, yeah, I, I, have, I don't, I don't have any desire to sort of pursue that. Therefore I don't kind of work on it and uh, yeah. aim to do that. You're aware of this, but people are kind of talking about this character as sort of being sort of prescient to the age we've sort of come into right now in the age of cancel culture, the age of yeah. comedy is dying. If we can't just come up with ideas and freestyle and talk about whatever's in the culture right now, what do you think about this whole conversation about wokeism and the idea that comedy is being suffocated right now? Uh, yeah, I don't see any real evidence for it. I mean, there's the, all these people that are complaining or making the case for it seem to be doing quite well. You know, I think uh, Dave Chappelle is probably the biggest example of it, but you know, Ricky Gervais and uh, they're all just, you know, at a, they're all ex ex extremely successful and popular and clearly capable uh, or, or clearly have the the space out there to say really whatever they want. So I, it's, it seems like just another f fake controversy. Um, you know, I think it's just also like as a, cre as a writer, as a creative person, like be, you know, having the ability to be open to the world changing around you and, uh, and having a sensitivity to that is just important as a person. So there, Eric and I talk about this all the time or Greg or whatever about just like, yeah, there's just totally things we did be in our past that we probably wouldn't do now if, and part of that is because of people out there who have, you know, have been, have been, you know, activists or, uh, voices for um their their causes or their issues that have you know culture changes people's perceptions change uh and i'm totally fine with that i don't think it's a problem uh i get to have a little fun because i can play with satire and do things that are you know that can be considered offensive or cr cross the line and i'm kind of protected or at least i think i am by the idea that I am commenting on that issue from an, a, the other side uh, and can kind of, because that's just how I feel, you know, and, and I'm refl that's how I express that a lot of the time. So um, yeah, it's just, it's not a thing. It, it, it's fun to write about. It's fun to argue about on Twitter, but, um, and, you know, but on the other side of that, uh, there there are things that that there should be accountability and responsibility for anything you do and say so if you are going to take a position that is controversial or offensive to a lot of people then there will be consequences you know so uh if you if it's if it matters that much to you and you feel so strongly about it then understand that that people are going to be upset by it and that that's been around forever mm. And you mentioned Chappelle, you mentioned Gervais. I have questions about each of them separately, and you you set yeah. me up for that nicely because the issue around this, and we'll get get into this issue of, of transgenderism because that right now is the hot button issue around comedy and in, in American politics where you are right now. You yeah. feel really strongly about this issue. You've been very vocal, and when you are vocal, you get a lot of traction. I saw mm -hmm. on Twitter you tweeting about it this week, and a lot of you know yeah. attention on that. You you posted a clip of Michael Knowles, who's a right wing uh, yeah. Daily Wire guy, and you basically called it straight Nazi talk. So, why do you feel so strongly about the transgender issue? And can you expand a little bit on why you felt compelled to call it straight Nazi talk? Short answer: I have transgender friends. I have close friends who have transitioned. You know, and I I have been able to experience what they go through through that process and or i've been able to you know witness or or sort of an appreciation for that process i've read about it i've talked to people uh you know who have gone through it and uh and i also just don't care you know what people want to do uh it's uh, and and what i i see it as a a man you know well I got a little pushback from this because I, I kind of look at it as like a, a wedge issue from the right. That's where they're like kind of desperately trying to uh, create, you know, the fear machine to 
to to kind of do what they always do and and the left can do this too but is to uh make people scared and 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 you know keep them on their side of the aisle um and it, it's they're running out of these wedge issues because they've they've won the abortion issue in a lot of ways and gay uh you know gay marriage and and gay issues have kind of become so normalized that they sound r ridiculous mm. uh with that issue um and so they have this they have this 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 transgender stuff that's very and and the pushback i got was sort of like because because i said you know almost speaking to my audience who are on the fence or have kind of been listening to this uh rhetoric and getting ginned up by it. it's like just it, be a you know from my perspective as a 47 year old man has been around a while watching this kind of stuff it feels like a it's just a it's a cold political tactic to you know where it's an it's a non-issue and and some people on the on the in the trans world were like it's not just that people are actually being hurt by this and people mm. are you know there are laws coming that are gonna or there are laws now that are uh, going to have real consequences. So yes, of course, it's not something to ignore, but I just wanted to express to my, or to anyone listening, listening that, you know, you might be uh, getting played here a little bit for political gain by getting upset about this stuff. Because again, it's, 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 a, it's a very small percentage of the population that have any inclination uh, to, to, you know, to go through a transition so dramatic or so, you know, kind of life changing. Um, and it's not something that you're probably going to have an issue in your own life with, you know, and if you do, then most likely you're going to find that the, that as it, if it comes into your life, let's say it's a cousin or a friend at work or something, you're going to, you're going to have the experience I have, which is, uh, you know, getting to know what that personal experience is and then having empathy for it. If you're a r rational kind of person and realize that, okay, this is just this person that, that wants, that has a different way of thinking and who cares? I, th I think the word normal gets thrown in a lot and it's sort of like, why do we care? What, why are we hung up on normal and, and all these uh, conventions that, that uh, as a kind of kid growing up, interested in alternative music and alternative comedy and art the last thing i want to care about is what what's normal you know what i mean and what you think is normal and uh and a lot of it just comes down to semantics and um of course there's like there there's an understandable uh you know window of confusion or uh, the feeling of, I don't get this, or I don't understand, you know, that's natural. Um, but it doesn't take long to get past that, you know, and as long as you're open to that, then you, there should be no issues at all. Yeah. And I think the key word you said there was empathy and I'm totally on board with you, just knowing people, listening to people and just having an open heart basically. And that's yeah. radically changed a lot of my views over my life. So I think that was, yeah. that was very well said. You know, a guy like Chappelle, right? He's sort of the main, the biggest comedian that goes on stage that talks about this thing. You know, is there a way to make jokes about transgenderism on stage at this stage that you think could be done cleverly? Or is is it kind of what you're saying? It, the atmosphere is too toxic that it all just really feels like punching down. Um, yeah, I I think anything's open to joke about. You know, if it's, if the intention is, uh, to make you laugh. Um, and it's so, I mean, I did this dumb joke that I kind of stopped doing, but it, it was it w just because it wasn't that funny. I mean, it wasn't even for my character, it wasn't that funny, but mm -hmm. it was like these bathrooms now, they're all gender bathrooms, right? You got these all gender bathrooms. Well, it's better than uh, restrooms. What am I going to do in there? Take a nap? You know, so yeah. that's just like a stupid right. play on words or whatever. But um it, it and it has nothing to, it's it's really not commenting at all about it's but it's coming from a place of somebody angry about the all gender bathrooms well who cares you know about the all gender bathrooms it's like if that helps the line go down as you're waiting to go to the bathroom maybe that's a good a good thing but um 
Yeah, I mean, I let George Carlin had this great routine about everything is funny in the right context, you know, and like you talked about rape and like he's like, just all you have to do is think about Elmer Fudd uh, raping and it's funny, you know, and, and it's sort of like I agree with that. I get <laughs> that some I mean, I, I agree that that's funny, uh, that image. Um, but so I do agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm on that side of it. I'm a little older and maybe I'm just like, uh, but, you know, it, it comes down to what do you really want to do? And what do you really want to get across? And is it worth it? Is it funny enough that it's going to offend people, you know, but right. Um, and then you just kind of don't worry about it and use and, and trust your instincts and trust your friends. Certainly, there's lots of things where like, you know what, that's, that's too much. But what what I kind of uh, realized is a lot of my work does kind of delve into dark territory. There's a lot of death and there's a lot of, you know, pain and, and, and disappointment, lots of these, these sort of colors of, of uncomfortability and weird father son relationships. And, you know, just like lots of darkness that that's in the comedy and what I kind of, the way I think about that is these are kind of natural uh, sort of fundamental tools that we use to play with ideas that are that are scary to us you know and we play in in waters that are that are scary or dangerous to help us process our true real feelings about things like death and alienation right. and uh, and you know all kinds of the dark stuff in our brains so I, you know i i swim in those waters often and find that it, it can be healthy for me and it can be healthy for the audience who might be like, Oh, I've been like, so strong, you know, like really struggling with my, you know, anxiety or my fear mm. of my mortality or whatever. And you guys, we watch you guys and you joke around about it and you don't take it too seriously. And so, yeah, I find that to be ultimately healthy, but understand that, we're in an age where people can be offended and people have a very big voice right now to express their offense. So, you know, take that as you will. Yeah. And I think, I think your point is, is well taken to the idea of when you do it, you're parodying people to laugh and see the insanity of those who are speaking out against transgender people. Mm -hmm. You're not putting a seed in people's heads. Oh, these people are mentally ill or these people right. are a menace to society and needy and, and, you know, just creating havoc. So I, I can definitely see that. And when it's a, like you said, people are dying every day for being trans. Yeah. They're being murdered all around the world. So it's like, I just can see like, I would, why would I take the risk on that when there's a billion other topics to discuss yeah, and laugh about? I mean, yeah. the other thing is that like, I'm just not a fan of what I'm calling like didactic uh, truth telling comedy with quotes mm. around truth telling, which right. is a lot of, which is a very popular form of comedy right now uh, with Chappelle and like Chris Rock's new special, you know, like there's this, there's this form of comedy that doesn't make me laugh. It doesn't make me smile. It is a man on stage, you know, stomping back and forth, yelling at the audience about what he believes is true. And there's, there's no possible way that, that that person can truly get down to what is true about any issue, mm. uh, especially when they're also trying to entertain and make those people laugh. I mean, uh, and, and I don't want to pick on Chris Rock because I think he's generally very funny but i watched his special and there's a moment where he does a joke that's like you know anybody that says words don't hurt has never been punched in the face and the crowd laughs and it's a hacky joke in my opinion and it's not true so what the you know what i mean what's the point of of going up there and acting like you're you know you're almost like a prophet or something where you're telling you're getting to the root of something and it gets distilled and it gets kind of you know, twisted for the sake of uh, a joke that he thinks is going to work in that room. Uh, and then it becomes kind of turned into the way people think, well, I guess that's true. You know, I guess that is true that that words don't hurt, you know, and you're like, come on, man, that, that's that's cheap, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I yeah. just I come from it like already not liking that kind of comedy because yeah. I think there's just way funnier 
things out there to me. And, and so when they start kind of prancing around, treating it like they're giving a sermon about any particular issue, uh, I get turned off by that. I just find it not a good use of my very short period, you know, short amount of uh, entertainment time yeah. I give myself. <laughs> no, and I think I, I love it because I'm thinking you said the word profit and that's your profit, Tim Heidecker on, on yeah. Twitter. And I love this yeah. idea of parroting people who think they have a prophetic voice to the, to the age and time. And I believe there are people that have prophetic voices, but I think the people that say they're that voice are, oh, yeah. are kind Biggest. of a bit deluded biggest red flag there is oh yeah. totally but on Chappelle, just just quickly on Chappelle, other outside of sort of this recent turn and the controversy around that issue do you rate him as sort of one of the greatest comedians of all time or do you place him high up on your list i never and i just total honesty here total honesty you could think people can think what they want about me but i never thought he was that funny i just didn't you know i don't know what to say I don't know why mm. I never liked the, I never watched all right, what I did watch of the Chappelle show. I thought, okay, yeah, I get it. It's like, you know, well crafted, but it's just not my kind of humor. You know, I just, uh, there's nothing I could Fair. do about that. Um, and, but, but then, you know, as years went by and it became more just very, uh, you know, uh, I, I just guys again, prancing around on stage, smoking the cigarette, having these, you know, I just want jokes. You know, I like when I want Stephen Wright or Emo Phillips or Steve Martin or, you know, um, people that uh, that just are delivering ideas and jokes and character. And um, I don't really care. I don't want to be enlightened by your perspective on the world. I don't care, you know? Right. I mean, George Carlin maybe is a good example of someone who did it really well, but he did, he had jokes and he had, a voice and and a per, you know and sort of a persona that that I liked growing up, but yeah, the whole style of I mean, I'd rather watch the Three Stooges, you know, I'd rather watch uh, an Albert Brooks movie. So it's it's just personal preference, really, yeah. when it comes down to that. Um, on the Ricky Gervais front, I know you've kind of tweeted some some hilarious attacks at him over the years, and, and I don't think you're a fan either, and you don't need to get into why you don't like him if you don't want. But I'm actually really curious if you liked. The Office. Oh because, God, yes. I mean, because that's like that was one of that's like my favorite show of all time. And just just quickly, just I think that sort of primed me to get you later on. Sure. So I'm, I mean, I, I was just curious what you thought of the show. Oh yeah, I mean, I can recall seeing it in 2002 or one or whenever it kind of came over here, and uh, seeing it on BBC America quite late at night and and not getting it, not. And I was a fan of the Christopher Guest movies, uh, so I should have got it, but I didn't know really anything about it. I just knew that it was supposed to be good, funny or something, and I didn't pick up on the rhythms of it right away. But then I did, and and just was obsessed with it, and was like, God, this is exactly what kind. Of, this is this is for me, you know. This is my style of humor, and um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's sort of like uh, the the Office was a ten. You know, and extras is like a nine and then whatever comes, you know, then you get, then you get this like drop off and drop off and drop off. And you're like, wait, was that guy, was that guy really just David Brent? You know, like you were like, yeah. how much of that guy was just a, not a character. And that's really more closer to who he is, but I don't know. I mean, he's not like the, I, he's just a, a, annoying and obnoxious to me and has sort of come, a, you know, sided with the dark side a little bit on certain issues, I guess, transgender stuff. And it's mm. very, uh, yeah, it's, it's disappointing. Cause I think there was, uh, the, uh yeah, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to not watch the office if I, because of who he has become, you know, but, um, maybe Stephen Merchant is the real uh, genius there in that. Yeah. Good point. Good, I, good evidence for that. I tend to agree with you on the, on the downside. And that was disappointing. Like he was the guy for me, that show changed everything for me comedically. Um, quickly moving on the, the Rogan sort of thing you did that went viral and, you know, everyone likes to ask you about this, but Joe yeah. Rogan is one of the most influential. He's one of the biggest comedians. He sells out stadiums. His podcast, I think is still like the number one show like in the world, basically, mm -hmm. right. In terms of viewership, you parodied that and you had this 12 hour conversation that was on loop in their sleep. We found that they were having, um, essentially dreams, wow. right? Um, and now what is dreaming? 
right? Define dreaming. Um, you know, I think it's a uh, imaginative uh, um, journey mm -hmm. that your sleeping mind goes on, which filters and processes human experience. And I know you're really proud of that thing and we're really happy that it got the traction that it yeah. got. But I'm curious too, because... I'm, I'm assuming because, you know, on office hours, you and your buddies are sitting around shooting the shit. And that's one of the yeah. greatest joys of life. So yeah. your problem with Rogan potentially or Joe Rogan experience and podcasts like this, is it less about just shooting the shit with nonsense or when you take that into opinion on scientific facts, uh, yeah. cultural, political things? Is that where the real beef is at? I guess so. I mean, I, the, my, the, the, the germ of it is, is for me, like, trying to have an open mind about that show. And occasionally I will stumble upon some interview that he does. It's kind of interesting, but my first, uh, my reaction has, was always sort of just like, it's just it's so boring. Like this is, I can't believe people are listening to this. It's so right. boring. They're not getting anywhere. They don't really come to any kind of, you know, conclusion on anything. I don't know. I've never listened to the, I've never gotten to the end of one of these, you know, I don't know where it, you know, I just kind of drop off and like fall asleep or something. So I kind of wanted to get into sort of like how I think that Joe Rogan show a lot of the time is kind of almost becomes music or, you know, background music for people. Cause there's no way all these people are just are sitting there listening to every word. If So it becomes this double talk, you know, yeah, I, I fell asleep to it for years. Yeah. And, and th that could be part of its popularity. It's sort of ASMR kind of relaxing two people talking. Uh, but then it gets weighted as sort of this like, you know, uh, intellectual uh, bastion of of uh, of higher thinking people coming on. And and I just don't get it. Of course, there's lots of uh, academics and people that go on there, but they end up talking to this, you know, grunt who is you know there's a certain appeal to your interviewer being kind of naive or kind of you know coming from a blank slate of understanding to kind of be you know, and to be curious and to want to know more and that's you know kind of putting him as like the audience you know from it's like you're you're he's one of the audience so i get that but then you know there there's an in there's also this sort of inside comedy this this culture of guys from the comedy store and uh, uh, that kind of bro hang thing that doesn't appeal to me but I, right. i'm a satirist and and i when i see something that irks me or bugs me or seems silly or or and it's in the culture my instinct is to not like rant about it like i am with you is to kind of right. try to satirize it yeah and, yeah you know, and I think you succeeded greatly. And I love the idea of the fact that most people don't make it to the end. So people probably assume you actually talked for 12 hours. That's yeah, that's yeah. To your I, point, yeah. people think, holy shit, they actually, but really it's like an hour and something, right? And then you looped it. That's the thing is you can pop in like any double Joe parody. Rogan. Yeah, you can pop into any Joe Rogan episode. Yeah, and yeah, I love that. Kind of like, all right, we're in the middle of something here. Yeah, yeah. Um, This whole idea, I'm so fascinated by this idea of grifters. And I know you're fascinated by this in a lot of ways as well. This this word is always in my head because I'm on Twitter all the time. I'm assessing all these public intellectuals or figures that are sort of at the, the top of the discourse. How do you discern between someone that you genuinely will start to dismiss and believe they're, they don't believe this, this is bullshit and they know it versus yeah. people that like, for example, Ben Shapiro, I'm not a fan of Ben Shapiro, but I don't think he's a grifter. I would not call him right. a grifter in terms of the views he espouses. Yeah. But how do you yes. discern? Because sometimes I find it difficult. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how I discern. There's a, a gut instinct. I mean, there's there's obvious sort of television. You know, I grew up watching my dad and I used to have a good time watching the televangelists of the 80s. You know, these guys, mm. this guy, Boris Cirillo was one. And, uh, and of course, Jim Baker, and Jimmy Swaggart. And so that kind of instilled a, a context, an understanding of like how sometimes raw and obvious it can feel when you're speaking in tongues and healing people with your hands that just immediately like bullshit uh you know alarms go off so um i mean everyone's grifting in a way you know like everybody is slinging something and there's an ulterior mo motive to everything uh in ben shapiro i agree i agree is probably more 
uh, he he has a g- genuine uh, beliefs that he is right. trying to uh, persuade people into believing. And but even that, it's an enter- it's entertainment. Like anything, it's anything you're watching, hugely off it, right? Yeah, yeah, it is a business model for cre- to create outrage or to create your attend to grab your attention to keep you there so that he can sell products and. And that I'm not picking on him. I think everybody in all media does that to some degree. Um, so yeah, I think it's case by case. There's very obvious ones, uh, and then there are there are sort of nebulous, like, yeah, okay, they they might believe this, but they're ginning it up for views or for you know their own their own attention. Elon Musk. Is taking up so much oxygen right now, especially mm-hmm. if you go on Twitter, half the tweets are about something Elon Musk did. His tweets are like speaking of grifters. Well, exactly. But I'm curious. A, I kind of want to lead in in a bit of a cheeky way because I was reading some stuff about you, and I think you drive a Tesla, or at least you did. So I do. you're a, you're a oh, fan well, of the, pro- yeah. the product. But what do you think about know. Musk, the man versus the the designer? Well, the, I yeah, I got the, I got the the Tesla like four years ago. I mean, I know he owned the company, but at the time. It was he. He was not sort of the pariah that he yeah. was. You yeah, know? no. Like he. No. And the and the car is fucking great. Like it. I mean, it's the cheaper one, just so it doesn't seem like you know I'm a Kardashian out here. But it, it's the <laughs> the ba- the base lot model one, and it was like, gee, I'd love to have an electric car, and I needed, and so it was like, uh, it was just a, an ex, it's an ex, it still is just an ex, excited. I don't. I'm not a car guy, but it's it's if you've ever been in one, it's just a fucking blast to be in it and it's good i guess for the environment i don't know you know yeah. there's arguments yeah, yeah, both. Yeah. but um yeah and i'm not I'm too lazy to trash it because uh of his his antics and you know i know a company is bigger than a man or a man is different than a company but um yes yeah, so you've 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 outed me i have <laughs> conflicting feelings about it but whatever um yeah, I mean, but he just seems like a. I mean, the, I read this thing about him. I, I guess it could be not true, but you look at his b- background, and there's so much, uh, you know, uh, grifty kind of activity with his, mm. his, his, you know, the the schooling he said he received versus what he actually received, and all these like, you know, this he's a, he's a he's like Trump, you know, he's a, there, there's a is a self made there's a self made image of him that has caught on with people that isn't really true, but it's working, you know, for him. And, uh, and the, the fanboyness fanboyness of it is, uh, perplexing to me. Cause it's, he just, again, another guy where at the core is like, this is like a boring dude, you know, it's like a boring, uh, kind of p- bad sense of humor, reactionary megalomaniac kind of personality or not, it's like super intense narcissism involved and, and, and yet people like care about what he thinks. Um, and so, yeah, he's just a, he's just a weird one. And, and most people care because they're obsessed with money and they're obsessed with their, you know, they're completely uh, fast, you know, sort of like want what he has or the, you know, there's mm-hmm. sort of this desire to be rich and we, we put yeah. tremendous importance and value on, on people's wealth. And yeah. so it, you know, he's a sort of a byproduct of the society's perspective on that. But yeah, no fast. I mean, I think you should burn the Tesla live on office hours. Like for views, maybe. <laughs> there you go. Um, just quickly switching gears to something a little bit serious. And if you don't want to get into this too much, and I'm framing the question the way I think you might be engaged with, but you talked about cancel culture, not really you know, being a thing and people can be canceled and sell out Madison Square Garden, right? But there is this accountability sort of Me Too area. And you had a very close sort of brush with that with the whole Andrew Callahan situation. Yeah. A guy that you were working with who put out this this great doc, This Place Rules, and, you know, has since sort of backed away because of sexual assault allegations. He's come out and apologized and, and seems to be working on himself. You've said, I think, everything you want to say about this on Office Hours, and I watched that. Yeah. But on that... um as someone that was so close to sort of a, a me too thing and maybe has taken time and was already probably thinking about it, any reflections on sort of what is at the root of sort of that sickness? I think, uh, again, I, going back to like culture changes, uh, relationships, how we see relationships change and, uh, what's acceptable in those relationships change. And sometimes 
people are slow to catch up to those changes, I guess, would be my only thing. I, I live a pretty boring life. I mean, it's not a boring life, but I, you know, I have been married for 15 years and have kids and I don't, uh, I don't have that. Uh, I'm not in the, I'm never in those positions to be navigating the new world of, you know, of dating and sex out there in the world. And, uh, I can only imagine that it can be confusing and mistakes can happen uh, and misunderstandings happen and all, all that kind of stuff. So I'm glad to not be in the, uh, the, the field of, <laughs> of dating. That's all, you know, it right. just seems, seems like a confusing time. And, um, and uh, but there are, there are people out there that should know better and, and should, uh, definitely uh always you know be you know it shouldn't be hard i think generally but i can understand uh being young and and making mistakes but you know that doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. apply to the andrew situation uh but yeah i i mean i i i my preference is just to not have anything to do with any of it because i just live my life and do what i think is is best for me and uh, I can't be, I can't control how other people behave and I can't, uh, be responsible for how other people behave, you know, that's on them. So that's about it. Yeah. Fair. I'm hoping for the best in that situation. And yeah, know, I do believe people are, you know, redeemable. It's something that I sort for of sure. believe in and I hope for the best in that just really quickly. I just remembered, you know, you're when, every time I study you and keep digging into your work, I realize how transformative sort of the stuff you've been involved with has been on me. Nathan for you, I think is, is one of the greatest shows of all time. And I, I read too, that it seemed like at first, maybe you didn't get Nathan Fielder, or at least couldn't really envision him being the lead on a show. Is that true? Like, can you remember your first impressions? Like, oh, this guy thinks he can be the star of a show. And then when you, yeah, I mean, it was the not, it's not a big deal. It's just, you know, there, he's a very understated kind of dry, quiet guy. And I think he was in the office doing this other show called John Benjamin has a van and he had a small part. And I, I mean, I was just, uh, I just met him and said, oh yeah, this seemed like a nice guy. I didn't, I didn't know he was as smart and funny as he is and so that's only that my you know your first impressions i don't think i've ever had the right first impression on anybody you know i have pretty good instincts but uh i think yeah it's just sort of like oh that guy hmm okay good luck you know and then he proved himself very quickly i want to get into music because i'm i'm a huge music nerd myself you know you just high school love that album and just super impressed the collaborators right up my alley mac demarco natalie from wise but lemon twigs who are excellent uh kurt vile how much joy do you get sort of producing this music for people and working with your friends it seems like you have a blast oh yeah um it's really really fun it's cha it's challenging because uh i'm not a i'm a nov i'm not a novice but like you know i'm not a top player or anything so i kind of do rely on other more talented people to help me get the music i i hear in my head out um i just did an album and we're still working on it and mixing it and stuff but i just did it with a very good band who i've been on tour with and i'm going to the uk with awesome. we did it was sort of the first time i was able to like get a full you know the same band in the same space uh for an extended you know like a week or so just working on the record, not doing anything else. So um, that's just so much fun. Playing with these guys is a joy. And I have a lot of, uh, you know, it, it like anything I do, there's a lot of, a lot of deliberation and thought and work and, and fine tuning and going back and fixing and stuff to get it where at least I'm happy with it. So it's a mix of pleasure and pain. Um, I like to think like, the, the joy I get from do it like the, the joy I get is in the, the writing and the solving the puzzle of the song, you know, is sort of, you know, all right, where's this song going? What's, what's the message or what, what's the third verse going to be? And then how does it sound? And what's the, all that stuff is, is ex, extremely joyful and, and satisfying. 
and then I kind of, then the record is done and, and it's no longer mine. You know, it's yours. It's not for me to have an opinion on even, or, you know, just sort of like, yeah. it's, it's, uh, I've, I've had my experience with those songs and that music. So, um, but I love the process and I love working with talented, friendly, fun people that I get to, uh, you know, that I don't know what else I would do with my time, uh, with these people, you know, sit and have a beer and, watch sports or something but to be able to play music together is is super fun i mean you struck gold with your friends and access to that my thing if i could have natalie do harmonies over any track of mine i'd be like i'm set everything i know I, I got so <laughs> lucky how nervous do you get when you release new music or especially when you started to do i'm sure you're more comfortable now because as someone who has dropped songs just on like instagram for my friends or something there's something I'll, like posting this interview is way less nerve wracking than posting a song. I'm yeah. curious what that feeling is like, like, holy shit, I'm going to put this out there as a piece of art. Yeah, I've gotten better at it and more used to it. I think by the time I'm happy enough to put something out, I feel good about it. And I feel like I'm not putting out stuff that I'm like embarrassed about. It's not, you know, it's something we put a lot of work into. So I feel like it's good. Um, I understand. And I know I understand that there are people that uh, don't like that kind of music, don't want that from me, um, you know, so I know that that's going to come. And, uh, but over time, in the past couple records, High School and Fear of Death, there's more of just like, oh, I actually like your music on its own. Like, I don't even need the context of who you are, or I, you know, and I, I, I can separate your comedy from your music. And so that just keeps happening more and more. And people are like, for me, it feels like it's a cool thing. It's just like a cool, I don't know anybody else doing it that way, where it's like, oh, I can appreciate, appreciate your work on a couple of different levels. It, it, you know, and I, 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 I don't, I'm not cringe. It doesn't, it's not cringy to listen to your music because, because of, the fact that you're a comedian you know what i mean no it does, so, the comedy the comedy cringe doesn't transition to the music man it's great yeah. stuff it's great indie thank indie you. rock and indie pop and yeah um thank you i was I said, yeah, yeah no a genuine <laughs> compliment and i also just as a quick point as someone who, who dabbles in songwriting i think the less you overthink and try to get fancy with chords and just feeling yeah. it and putting it out that's the classics like i'm always shocked like when i look at like a Mac DeMarco chord structure. I'm like, this whole song is C and G. That yeah. little song is just DNA. Cause I'm thinking if I don't have four or five chords, people are going to think I suck. Yeah. And I almost think the more limited you are and the less you overthink it, that's where all the classics come from, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I have a song that I just, uh, that on this new record, I think it's going to be the opening track. That's, that's one chord. And mm -hmm. there's a, uh, you know, which chord? Uh, it's a, it's a D, but it's a capo. So it's a played, nice. played like a C shape, but, Nice. Um, it, it's, uh, yeah. And we're all like my bass player, not, uh, my bass player, Ellie, uh, was like, Ooh, the one chord song. That's like the, <laughs> that's like the thing that you're always trying to get, you know, trying to find, uh, what is the Beatles song? Love, uh, the word, you know, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a few that you can kind of, uh, strive towards and it's short enough so it doesn't get too boring, but, um, yeah, I agree. I don't play, I don't, I don't get fancy with chords and I, I i think the most amazing thing is the just bottomless well of three chord four chord songs that are still out there to be written you know and i'm like oh shit this little the song buddy on my record i'm like this is just a g c g d7 buddy i've been thinking about you All of the shit that you've been through. And boy, I don't think I've quite heard it done exactly like this uh, right. with this melody, you know, and like you're just I'm sure there's things that are similar to it. But uh, yeah, uh, over thousands and thousands of songs that I've heard, I think this one's different enough, you know, and that's always sort of the thing. It's like, it's just different enough that I can get away with this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, that's such a, that's, I'm glad you agree with that. Cause I think that's, I needed to get that in my head to feel comfortable doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I loved hearing and reading that, that a Neil Young performance an unplugged performance was basically yeah. the, the catalyst for picking up the guitar. There's this performance. And I'm curious if you've seen it too, the BBC old man version where he's oh, yeah. in the BBC. That's like one of my favorite performances yeah. of all time, but you see in concert. Yeah. 
Yeah. And there's like a small crowd around him. Uh -huh. What do you remember about that perform? That's like a pit, such a pivotal moment for why you even do music. If I, if I read correctly, what do you think it was about that performance in Neil himself? Yeah, I think it was the quietness of it. And, you know, he's doing the little harmonics and in, in context of SNL, which is very loud and busy and they often have big rock bands on just to see a man in the center of the stage on a stool kind of command the audience and create total, you know, uh, focus on him. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's like a little bit of a lie in the song because there's, there's that performance, which is just, just him. And then I think later in the week or a few weeks later, he's on the tonight show and he had a small band with him. And, and for the, for the drums, he had a guy with a broom and it was going, Shh, yeah, I watched it in advance of this. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I combine, I combine those two memories. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, there was, I mean, I, in a, of course, in any story you're like simplifying and dis, and distilling something down to for the sake of the song, of course, there was tons of things going on in my life at the time that made me want to play music. So that was just the one I kind of picked out of the memory box for the sake of the song. But yeah, it's, it, it was strong enough that it stuck with me. I think seeing Randy Newman as one of your big influences really struck me a bit because I think I'm one of those people who have dismissed him for so long and just only yeah. knew him from the Toy Story stuff. So to, to the to the Randy Newman haters or like, what is A, your argument, why he's great and where should they actually go to look for the stuff that inspires you? I'm assuming it's not the Toy Story stuff, although I'm not saying- No, I mean, I'll, I'll, it's all great. I think like, the you know, if you, you get uh, Sail Away and Good Old Boys, those two records are just- beautiful concept records they're beautiful um sounding they just sound the great top session players of the 70s are on that record uh stories are great songs are great you know there there's a real uh singularity to both of those records that are very warm to me and and it's just a very intimate listening experience i think you just kind of warm up to his voice it's that that thing of like he's got a very distinctive voice um and it's not for everybody, but for me, it really, it really struck a, a, a chord, no pun intended. The artificial intelligence in the creative space, I, I was struck by the fact that Sirens of Titan kind of looks like what an AI is creating for artists today. And I feel like you might must have strong opinions on whether or not you think AI coming into the songwriting process, music video, uh, album covers, is this uh, something that you're against? Are you for it? Are you okay with this sort of evolution? I'm... Um, uh, on the fence, I, I think, you know, I always, I, I assume the AI is already making most of the music I hear at the mall or in waiting rooms. You know, I don't, yeah. I, I don't, I don't get most pop music that I would hear in like the salon or anything. It just, it sounds completely manufactured by, you know, algorithms. Um, and so that, that's going to, that, I mean, there's, that's an inevitable, uh, trajectory for sort of consumer pop music that just fills spaces and airway, you know, and, and public spaces. Um, I think it, I think AI can be a, a great tool. Um, it's, I think it's uh, from talking to some people that know more about it than me, there is, I think it's another in the same case as the transgender thing. It's a little bit of an overblown story. I think it's still many years from kind of, truly replacing a lot of the things that creative people or any people do it still requires human input in a lot of right. in a lot of ways and direction and so um i, I don't feel like i'm going to be replaced by it i think it's going to be helpful as a tool in a lot of ways so i'm not like anti ai i think there's probably mm. going to be a lot of good that comes of it and the the crap that comes out that's already crap if it's made by ai i don't really care one way or the other you know nice um are there any cryptocurrencies you want to shout out the listeners should go buy right now uh before we uh, end, high, points. Is it high, high points high points yeah awesome high i know points. you hate cryptocurrencies um sure. dude you've been so generous with your time super pleasure honor to meet you thanks for doing all the creative Thank stuff you. you do and inspiring people like myself i'll see you in london yeah see you in london thanks Good nice talking to you man. see you soon man cheers bye